So hello, everybody, and welcome to our special virtual event on Afghanistan. What should happen now, particularly how the world should respond to the humanitarian disaster that's already bad and looks set to get much worse over the, over the winter. Uh, my name is Richard Atwood. For those of you who don't know us, the International Crisis Group is an independent organization dedicated to preventing and resolving conflicts, stopping human suffering caused by war. We have experts in about 40 countries across the world. We've been working in Afghanistan for almost 20 years. So a UN report just last week said that since the Taliban took over uh, Afghanistan two and a half months ago, the country's on the brink of the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Uh, UN agencies estimate that some 23 million people, that's more than half the Afghan population, won't have enough food to get through the winter unless a lot more aid gets in. Obviously, there's a lot of reasons for the crisis. Afghanistan has been at war for 40 years. A lot of people are displaced. There's been recent droughts. There's the fallout from the pandemic. But a big part of it is that the economy is collapsing, largely because foreign aid, which the Afghan economy has for years depended on, has dried up since the Taliban took over. Western donors, in essence, won't give non-humanitarian aid or sanctions relief or recognize the Taliban government until it meets a set of conditions. Among them, the more inclusive government, respecting, protecting human rights, which means allowing girls to go to school, allowing women to work. And so far, the Taliban shows little sign it's going to compromise. Afghans are bearing the brunt of the standoff. So we're going to talk about all this with a tremendous panel. Uh, we've got um, Rahmatullah Amiri, who is an independent consultant, uh, senior researcher with the Liaison Office. Thank you very much, Amiri, for joining. Really great that you've been able to participate. Uh, we've also got Laurel Miller, who is Crisis Group's Asia Director. She's responsible for all our Asia work. Uh, before joining Crisis Group, she was a senior US diplomat. She served for some time as acting special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we have Saad Mokseni, uh, who is a Crisis Group trustee, and of course, also chairman and CEO of Movi Media Group, which runs Tola TV and Tola News, two really important TV channels in Afghanistan. I'm also delighted that another crisis group trustee, Ahmed Rashid, is joining us. Uh, Ahmed has written several books on Afghanistan and the Taliban, and uh, we'll say a few words after the discussion. So I'm going to talk to Amiri, Laurel, and Saad for about uh, 20, 25 minutes. I'll then turn to Ahmed for some of his thoughts, and then we'll open up for questions from people listening in. Uh, if you have a question, please just type it in the Q&A box, stating your name uh, and your affiliation. I should add, we're recording this, so it's all on the record. It will appear on our website. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's recording live. So could we start then by talking a little bit about this terrible humanitarian situation combined with a, with a, a, a tanking economy? Saad, could I, could I ask you a bit about that? What, what does it look like at the moment in Afghanistan? Well, I mean, um, uh, images of uh, people hang off aircraft as, uh, as Kabul was falling was stressful. But what we're seeing in Afghanistan today genuinely is keeping us uh, up at night. Uh, uh, someone explained it this way to me. Um, it took 11 years for Syria um, to lose half of its GDP. And it's happened in Afghanistan within a couple of months. And if this continues by, I think, March or April of next year, 98% of the population uh, will be under the poverty line. Um, and I mean, we're talking about perhaps potentially um, hundreds of thousands of, of people dying of starvation. And um, we've gone from, you know, the world pumping eight and a half, nine billion dollars into the economy directly and indirectly to zero. Um, and right now, there is just no economy. Uh, the banking sec sector is completely dead. You can't, you know, literally uh, take money out of, out of your bank account. And no one's getting paid salaries. Uh, there's virtually no trade. There are goods in the marketplace, but you know, the people just don't have the money to buy products. And uh, it's getting cold in Afghanistan, where winter is usually harsh in the country. So, and... The, the, the sense of desperation, I mean, we had uh, this interview with the uh, WFP um, uh, head for, for the region who broke down uh, while talking to the BBC. Uh, so there's a sense that 
you know, people have disengaged, uh, and particularly the Americans. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we, we as Afghans, uh, you know, we, we just don't know what to do because, you know, obviously the uh, people are not happy with the Taliban in terms of its policies. But the question we keep on asking is what about the 38 million Afghans who are stuck inside the country? Um, and, uh, and, you know, obviously we're, you know, I'm in the US right now and it's, you know, how to re-engage the Americans to first and foremost, come up with a policy. There is no Afghanistan policy beyond perhaps CT and getting some of these translators and other people associated with Western governments out of the country, which is probably 10, 20,000 individuals. But the rest of the country, I mean, uh, are we going to allow for this to happen? Um, the UN uh, mentioned to me last week uh, when I was on a call with them that what we will see in Afghanistan potentially has never been seen before. It's, it's like South Sudan, Rwanda, and Syria combined, uh, Yemen on steroids. I mean, these are the, ex the expressions used. And I think time is of the essence. If we don't move fast enough, um, it will impact hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of, of Afghans stuck inside of Afghanistan. And Saad, just briefly, if I could ask a, a follow-up, and we'll talk about international policy in more depth in a moment. But what you're talking about is, is this, these, are, these are problems that are not going to be fixed by humanitarian aid alone. Humanitarian aid can help stem some of the effects, but a lot of what you're describing requires more than humanitarian aid. Is, is, is that right? Well, yes. I mean, for example, um, Af uh, Afghanistan's uh, assets of, uh, you know, obviously $9 billion, give or take, um, are frozen um, because of a uh, uh, decision by the U.S. government to, 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 to freeze these assets. But also, uh, there's approximately $2 billion of private sector money also frozen. And Afghanistan needs about $2 or $3 billion just to maintain trade. Um, and they don't have the, 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 the resources to pay for salaries. Ironically, while the world is demanding for girls to go to back, back to schools, but we can't even afford to pay for teachers who may potentially teach girls uh, at our schools. And 11 provinces are now allowing for girls to ret have returned to, uh, to, to their schools. Uh, it, it, it's an extraordinary situation we're stuck in. And, um, and it just this, this lack of will to get involved. Humanitarian uh, assistance obviously is not conditional on, uh, on what the Taliban do. But they're all, they're all somehow connected. Um, and I think everyone is just at a loss as to what to do next. Um, but US leadership is really important. And I think the Americans have to figure out how they're going to become relevant, how they're going to engage with the Taliban. They have no choice but to engage with the Taliban, how to engage with the region. Um, and, and, and you know the downgrading of the special envoy's position. Now this, uh, this new gentleman, Tom West, reports to Don Liu, um, the Assistant Secretary of State, State rather than um, Tony Blinken, uh, um, shows that it's been downgraded and no longer it's no longer a priority for the U.S. government. And the fact that uh, there was a meeting in Moscow, the Americans uh, decided not to attend that meeting. It means that they're pretty much unwilling to engage, and uh, and these are all warning signs for all of us. So let's talk in a moment about US policy. But Amiri, could I come to you first? And, and could you tell us a little bit about how the Taliban itself sort of sees this, this uh, unfolding humanitarian crisis, the, the, the economy tanking? Uh, how does the government see this? I mean, is it, is it likely to, 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 to compromise because of the sort of desperate plight of so many people? Um, thank you. So, I mean, at the moment, uh, uh, Taliban, uh, got everything by surprise. The takeover, everything was a surprise to them. They didn't expect, uh, as Taliban themselves says that they expect it will take longer, it will be a process and everything will slowly uh, go into their hands. But then all of a sudden on August 15, everything fell apart and you know, Taliban the government, got the government. And I often say to my friends that I wanted to tweet that day that we lost the change Taliban the very last minute. So all those things that Taliban have thought about it, that they would probably, you know, make some compromises. As uh, right now, 
sort of out of their hands uh, because uh, you know um, uh, uh, there's no right now uh, strong oppositions against them they control the government almost entire uh, entire country so that makes them in a very strange position on the other hand they have uh, you know the international community you know who are you know the whose engagement has gone uh, uh, as uh, one of the colleague mentioned is uh, from you know uh, important engagement to more uh, you know some sort of loose engagement right now especially from the us and um, so that's why you know all those uh, promises that they want to make they want to make sure that they uh, calculate it right and make the right decision how to where to use those you know what they call the upper hand against the international communities. So the compromises that they see right now is sort of like, uh, you know, the upper hand that they need. That's why, for example, if you check Zabibullah Mujahid interview just a couple of days ago, is that uh, a statement, which is like two or three days ago, is like, you know, if they don't uh, recognize and work with the Taliban government, uh, they might uh, face threats, you know, basically saying is that uh, we will not cooperate with you on those things. Now coming to, um, so, I mean, on one hand, uh, I mean, we do expect, uh, you know, Taliban uh, to come up with, uh, with, with some sort of uh, compromises. For example, I mean, uh, women, uh, girls' educations. I, I, first of all, I don't see that as a compromise. I mean, a lot of Taliban agrees to that, especially the leadership, everyone. I don't know why it has become a political issue. Women's uh, education was always on their agenda with or without the international uh, support. So they will allow that. That's, I don't see, I mean, that's one of the things right now, if you see everywhere on Twitter, you know, that's all they talk about uh, women's education. So educations all the way to universities from our engagement with the Taliban that is not an issue but right now they I mean they see it more as a uh, political tools to use because we see a lot of uh, you know here and there voices about women education and the second is um, women rights that's the issues where we you know where we will I mean the international community will have a lot of issues to deal with the Taliban and the other is um, is terrorism uh, that will you know that they how they will you know compromise with the international community and the most the two most important ones will be for the international communities uh, is uh, uh, media and uh, civil societies you know so that's those are the areas so women education is uh, i mean from our engagement with them talking to them that's not an issue they will eventually allow it but what they will you know restrict is more media in civil societies because they will because their definition of national security and national interest is far narrower than you know the previous uh, government or you know how they will uh, uh, com uh, com uh, than the previous government so that will be an issue so we have both a, a sort of like a, a disappointments where taliban are kind of like um, uh, you know, uh, 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 kind of using, uh, you know, this uh, uh, compromise as, as a political tools uh, to kind of get, especially women educations and, uh, you know, uh, to, to get the world to recognize them and help them. But on the other hand, the good thing is that you know, when you when you listen to Taliban, what they say they implement, the good thing is that they haven't come up with a statement that this is how it's going to be. Then that's when I see an issue. For example, if they come up with a woman uh, education's plan that this is how we're going to do, then they will implement that. And then if it's something not in line with the international standards or there's issues where they're not allowed, then, then, that, then that's going to be a problem. So, so far, we don't see Taliban coming up on many of these issues. They don't come up with a statement what exactly they're going to do, including girls' education, including women's rights, including terrorism, including, for example, media, including civil society. So on one hand, that, that they don't, uh, they, are, they did not basically state their position as a good thing. On the other hand, the lack of, you know, uh, coming up these things as a statement is also an issue. So, uh, so where's somewhere in the middle. The Miri, as, as you say, that they haven't put out statements on some of these things, which might leave some space open for negotiations. But it's also true that, that by, by what they've been doing, doesn't suggest an awful lot of, of, of compromise. I mean, a lot of what they're doing suggests that they're playing mostly to an audience within the Taliban itself, 
but the focus is on keeping the movement together, that that seems to be the main constituency for a lot of these decisions, rather than what even the region, let alone uh, Western donors want. Yes, I mean, the, one of the problem of uh, the Taliban as a um, sort of uh, government or regime is that they are, uh, their decision making is consultative. Uh, so there are a group of people that make decisions, you know, they have to take everything into consideration, everybody's idea into considerations. A lot of these issues, for example, if you check their agenda, what decisions they may make, these issues are not even on agenda. And the, on the other hand, these are very sensitive issues within their groups. Uh, I mean, we uh, shouldn't three months or two and a half months is not a long time for an organization of this level and taking over a country. So we're here talking about a country. We're not talking about anymore about Taliban as a non-state actor. We're talking Taliban as a sort of uh, running a state. So, mm, uh, so, we, so we see these issues. So it's, it's going to be there for a, for a while, uh, I guess. Uh, and Amiri, Laurel, I'll come to you in a moment just to talk about a little bit about uh, how things look from Washington. But just before we do that, just very quickly, Amiri, could you just talk a little bit about the local uh, Islamic State branch, uh, Islamic State Khorasan province, uh, just so, so people hear a little bit about what's happening with that, because there seems to be really quite a, a sort of quite a, 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 a vicious fight going on now between the Taliban and ISKP, as it's, it's called, in, in Nangarhar and parts of the, of, of the east. How much does, should this be seen as a sort of threat to the Taliban? I mean, uh, just um, ISKP is a threat, but it will be not the main threat to the Taliban. Uh, but Taliban is making it more uh, difficult for themselves by, you know, uh, uh, committing some horrible crimes uh, uh, by hanging people without courts and, you know, under the name of ISPK and others uh, across the country. Mm. So, but it's uh, uh, the problem is uh, is that uh, you know there are a lot of Taliban are quite unpopular uh, among uh, the urban population and uh, among some uh, uh, you know even rural populations they're quite unpopular. It doesn't mean they won the war that they're popular among. Uh, so they're quite unpopular. So within those unpopular communities, um, especially among youth, uh, so what options do they have? Uh, so the options they have is the, for example, uh, the Northern Alliance uh, and. Uh, the ISPK. These are just the, the, the issues that there are two options. The problem with the Northern Alliance, first, they don't have a lot of physical presence. And the second, they are known as a, they, they are also quite unpopular because of the corruptions and all the, the, the things that they have committed over the last 20 years. And one of a lot of youth uh, blames them for the current situations, you know, like those who consist or uh, not just the Northern Alliance, any other groups that, you know, uh, that form any alliance, uh, you know, outside or inside of Afghanistan from the, from those actors who have been involved in the last uh, in the last 20 years so the two options the most the the, the, the options that is uh, uh, that is close active and you know ideologically you know can recruit is the ispk that's why you know right now um, um uh, 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 they, are, they are more favorite to, 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 to a lot of those young boys and boys who wants to join uh, uh, join a group against uh, the Taliban. And the, these, uh, you know, uh, some of the, the way uh, so the Taliban behave in, especially the locals, uh, Taliban behave in, uh, treated the local population um, uh, really increase even this more further that, you know, uh, uh, that these guys are here for some sort of, uh, you know, uh, revenge. For example, if you go back to 1990s, you know, in 1996, when Taliban entered to Kabul, especially went to Shamali, one of the reasons the fight erupted back because there was seems like Shamali, the Shamali plain outside of Kabul, uh, the people there didn't want, especially the commanders we interviewed, they didn't want to fight. But then when one of the Taliban commander shot on a picture of one of their leader in front of them, that's when they got really upset that, you know, we thought you guys are here to, you know, to, to take, uh, to remove these warlords, but you guys are not here to so that's in that context right now the ta local taliban commanders fighters that for example treat a lot of people with disrespect even if those are like for example you know uh, not popular because still that hurts the community you know and that leads to these people to do um, uh, to do something and uh, take arms that's one side the other side of the story is that ispk um, has been very popular in eastern afghanistan and uh, uh, it's also sort of like uh, we can call it central Af 
Afghanistan. So basically, Ningarhar, uh, Kunar, uh, uh, Lagman, uh, Kapisa in Kabul, in uh, Panjshir in Parwan. But there are two other, it's Bitahrir and you know, a few other uh, Jamaat al Islam. there are other groups too. So some of those are actually right now sidelining uh, with them because one of the common denominator between them is that there are like some of these groups have the Salafis or Wahhabis denominator. So they share the same ideology and they are um, uh, slowly, uh, uh, you know, uh, going to the ISPK uh, side. So uh, I think it will continue and uh, the way if Taliban continues the policy that they have been uh, doing. And the other is that, look, the, 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 the one last thing I want to just point it out here about ISPK is that it's just not just the, 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 uh, the, you know, these reasons, but it's also, you know, lack of jobs, uh, you know, um, people have nothing to do. I mean, they get really upset. Uh, I mean, especially if you go to Kunar. I mean, if there is a third party, uh, not Northern Alliance or other uh, coalitions that have been formed or the ISPK, if a third party comes into, I'm sure more people will join that third party, you know? And, and in fact, they will overrun districts and centers uh, without any problem, um, and uh, so that 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 pose that lack of uh, I mean lack of jobs and you know uh, and and the, the, the disappearance of uh, everything within just a uh, couple uh, days and um, weeks uh, really hurt the communities and uh, they are looking for alternatives what to do and how to take uh, uh, revenge or looking for something to do. Thank you, Amiri. Uh, so. Uh, Laura, let's talk a little bit about uh, sort of how Western donors are, uh, are seeing the situation, particularly let, let's start with 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 Washington and, and sort of as, as, as Saad suggested, how much do you think now the, the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan is sort of weighing on policymakers' minds? How much is it shaping sort of their thinking in terms of sort of non, what the conditions would be for non-humanitarian aid, for sanctions relief, uh, you know, recognition of the government are probably some, some way off. But are these conditions sort of seen as immutable, as something that's, that's, that, that, that the Taliban have to do before aid comes in? Or is there, is there a chance of some sort of more gradual process where uh, some aid is released in the hope that the Taliban will move and then more as, as the Taliban compromises? Well, I'm sure that the, the, uh, the humanitarian situation and the economic decline in Afghanistan weighs on many minds. Um, the question is what to do about it. Um, I, I don't think we have a situation where very clear conditions have been asserted yet. Um, that's certainly not the case on the US part that there is a specified list of conditions that if you meet these conditions, then these steps to relieve the economic situation will be taken. The European Union has stated a framework of a five part framework of conditionality, but it's fairly um, flexibly stated so that it would require if you were going to use that framework in a much more specific way of uh, step for step, you do this, then we will do that it would need to be elaborated to a much greater degree. I think the basic policy dilemma is that the US and other Western donors have incompatible objectives right now. On the one hand, they do want to prevent a failed state in Afghanistan, or they would desire there not to be a failed state in Afghanistan. And there is a recognition that humanitarian assistance alone is not going to be enough to ensure that essential services are provided, um, that there is a functioning public sector, and that the economy gets going again. Um, but on the other hand, they want that uh, objective to be achieved without in any way helping the Taliban to continue to consolidate their grip on power and without being complicit in uh, enabling the durability of the, the Taliban regime. And so this leaves the US and other donors looking for a very narrow path between these incompatible objectives. And I would say my own judgment is, I'm not at all certain that that narrow path really exists. And so what, what Saad re referenced as the kind of lack of policy is I think a trying to grapple with where can we find this, um, you know, searching around for this narrow path that 
you know, may or may not actually exist. I mean, we're in a situation where there are the, there is the continuation of a sanctions regime by the U.S. Um, by the U.N. You normally would have sanctions in place and a freezing of aid, as has been done, and a uh, a cutoff of financial resources if you're trying to erode a government's control, if you're trying to pressure a government. So the idea that you would maintain those sanctions and that suspension of aid is in opposition to any kind of effort to build up self-sufficiency of the Afghan state and uh, a self-sustaining um, uh, economy in the country. So, I mean, I think what we're seeing now in terms of what donors are trying to do is there are a lot of ideas being floated around for by the United Nations, um, by independent analysts and others for how you might be able to, how donors might be able to work around the Taliban um, government. And these ideas center on uh, what I would describe as sort of NGOifying or UNifying portions and even privatizing portions of government in Afghanistan, um, functions of government functions in Afghanistan. So, for instance, with respect to the central bank, which is whose all of whose assets has been frozen, there are ideas floating to essentially privatize the central bank functions. Other ideas to sort of put the UN between the Taliban leadership and the, the operation at a more technical level of government so that it can manage the finances of government. No one knows at the moment whether any of these ideas will actually work. Most of these have never been tried before or have only been somewhat tried in different conditions. No one knows yet if the Taliban will go along with these kinds of proposals. And it's also unclear whether they would, even if you could execute these measures, as I said, to kind of NGOify and privatize elements of the Afghan state, would those kinds of mitigation measures actually inspire enough confidence um, in, on the part of the private sector and Afghans to sort of invest in the future and, uh, and bring back economic activity. These are, uh, you know, things that maybe can be tried, but it's not at all clear whether they would work um, in, this, in this broader sense. Presumably, though, the, the NGOifying, uh, the, the UNifying, I mean, this, it's, it, you, it can only go so far with this, and it's, it's hard to see even for the healthcare system, for example, I mean, is, is, it, is it possible to prop up to stop the healthcare system collapsing without doing something with the, with, the, with the Ministry of Health, with the Taliban government? Is it possible to do that? Is it possible, for example, to, to pay other civil servants? I mean, the civil servants are not getting paid, haven't been paid since the Taliban took over. Or, for example, paying over the winter to keep the power on, the power mostly imported. I mean, can this sort of thing be done through, as you say, through, through without working? With the Afghan government, I mean, is that is is that possible, or is it is it simply simply people are looking for something that that, that isn't feasible? I mean, there there are a number of things that you can do to prop up, to bandage, to mitigate along the lines of what you described. Power, someone could pay for the power um, for some period of time. What propping up measures are not going to do is get Afghanistan beyond the point of needing sort of endless propping up endless propping up that addresses some humanitarian needs, but does not either restore the situation to the more robustly propped up state before August 15th, um, nor does it return, nor does it put Afghanistan on any kind of path towards a more self-sustaining situation. And in a context in which there is not appetite in the international community among donors for the, the extent of propping up that happened over the last 20 years, uh, I don't think you're going to see that kind of shift beyond, you know, emergency bandaging, if those are the kind of measures that are taken. To do something that would, would be a, uh, would potentially put Afghanistan on a somewhat more self-sustaining path and be more than a humanitarian bandage would require 
turning back on development assistance, turning back on the kinds of programs and funds that you could not execute without engagement with the state. I mean, the idea that you could create a functioning state of Afghanistan without a functioning Taliban government, if that's the only government, is fantastical. <laughs> These things go together as we recognize everywhere else in the world. You don't have a functioning state and a functioning economy in a positive sense and in a formal economy sense with a completely um, incapable and dysfunctional government. So I've got some questions, but Saad, could I go first to you? I mean, do, do, you, do you have any thoughts on any of that? Or, or, or I mean, another question is, is, I mean, how much can, can the Taliban, uh, can Afghans look to their, to their neighbors to, to, rather than traditional Western donors? And is there a chance that, that China would step in with, with, with any financial aid, not traditionally something it's done before? Uh, our governments in the region, which are uh, which have put con some conditions or some requirements of the Taliban. They want a more inclusive government, but not some of the conditions that the European Union's put on, for example. Is that potentially another source of source of support? You know, in my discussions uh, with the Taliban, and, uh, as well as uh, others who've met with the Taliban over the last few weeks, uh, what's becoming apparent is that uh, there's a lot of inconsistency. Uh, whereas some would tell you we're happy for the World Bank or UNICEF, to pay health workers or teachers directly. Uh, for example, the Haqqani network, uh, the, the, the Haqqanis, um, uh, the interior minister and his brother have made it very clear in other meetings that they would like uh, payments for teachers, for example, or, or doctors to go directly through them. So there's that inconsistency. We don't have a clear answer from the, from the Taliban in terms of how we can bridge this immediate gap in terms of paying healthcare workers and our teachers. Um, Although they, you know, there are some, some, uh, some ideas on the table in terms of how we can go about this. Um, China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, no way. Uh, uh, Mullah Baradar, the deputy prime minister was in China. They um, committed to giving him a million dollars um, to help, a million dollars. Afghanistan needs uh, somewhere between 25 and $30 million a day. Um, there is no way that the region can can uh, can uh, uh, fill that vacuum, I, I, and I think this is where the opportunity is for the Americans and the Europeans to work with the region. They seem to have a little bit more leverage than everyone else, uh, perhaps not as much leverage as they had, say, six months ago, twelve months ago. It's still, I think this is this has to be a joint effort, um, and uh, you know, and this is a sad reality. I mean. There are some positives. I mean, one of the positives is that they're, they're collecting probably about two or three million dollars in customs uh, duties, which will not last if the economy continues to tank. But that's about the same as what was being collected during the Ghani administration. So, uh, you know, a less corrupt government is actually delivering more in terms of uh, customs revenues, despite uh, the, the collapse in the economy. That, that, that's not going to last, for, you know, uh, in the months ahead, but still. It's a sign that um, in some areas, there's, they seem to be doing a better job. But my concern is that if the country falls apart this way and if they cannot deliver, then there's gonna be, obviously people are gonna rise up if they have nothing to lose and they have no food. And my concern is that this window of opportunity will disappear because the Taliban will then, you know, they'll be cornered and they, will, they may say, well, this is not working for us. Let's go back to the way we handled the country in the 1990s, and you will see a more belligerent Taliban in Kabul, even more belligerent than today. And you may see a Khmer Rouge type regime emerge where they would say, we don't care how many people die, it's God's will, and it's the fault of the international community. And they will be faced with you know, not just domestic economic uh, challenges and hu uh, humanitarian challenges, but they will also be faced with perhaps the fragmentation of the movement itself and the rise of ISIS. I mean, there, there is clear evidence nowadays. I mean, you're seeing Taliban flag, uh, ISIS flags in Kandahar, the birthplace of the Taliban. It was just unthinkable even weeks ago to see, the, uh, to see ISIS emerge in the south of the country. So there are multiple challenges facing the country. And I think this is, this is where we need uh, Western, namely US leadership on, uh, 
on 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 how to deal with these uh, with these challenges. So there's a question in the in the chat about uh, about Pakistan. Uh, so perhaps uh, Saad or Amiri or Laurel, could, could I ask you? I mean, how how is Islamabad viewing uh, what's now happening in Afghanistan? Obviously, Pakistan has traditionally had very close ties to to the Taliban, to parts of the Taliban. I mean, are they are they reasonably comfortable with the Taliban takeover, or are there are there things that are that are now worrying Pakistan as well? I, just very quickly, and then Amir can jump in. I, I think they're nervous because they own the Afghan problem today. Um, Perception-wise, people feel that Pakistan has the most leverage, and and their group, their 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 boys, the the Haqqanis, came into Kabul first, obviously prompted by Pakistan. They said they have some of the key positions. They have a good relationship with the Mullah Yaqub, uh, but it, it, it's a victory. They know that. Um, It'll feel good for about five seconds, and now they're they're wondering what to do next and how to engage the world, because I think even the cost of a few hundred thousand people um, going to Pakistan it's going to be enormous. Um, I read some UN report that um, you know if we expect people to escape to Pakistan, Iran, and Central Asia, the cost of that immediate cost will be about a billion dollars. No one in the region has that sort of money. So Amiri, before I come to you, I would like, uh, if possible, to uh, bring in uh, Ahmed Rashid. Uh, Ahmed, if you're if you're there, can you uh, can you join? Uh, is one of the is somebody going to work their magic and uh, and introduce uh, Ahmed into the into the into the call so he can speak? Excellent, thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Please go ahead. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I can. I, I just want to be, deal very briefly with a, with a number of subjects. The first is, I think, what is essentially lacking in the Western Alliance or or the outside world is there's a complete lack of leadership. The Americans are not providing the kind of leadership today um, uh, uh, on on the humanitarian or the political or or it really at any level. And what is dr drastically needed, in my opinion, is a is a experienced mediator who should be put in charge of dealing with this uh, contradictions in the humanitarian crisis. Um, preferably, somebody from the UN, if not an international diplomat who's revered and uh, acceptable to the world community. We need leadership, and we need somebody to negotiate what or you know what Laurel um, spoke about. Um, and, you know, so I think the most imp important, uh, the only way out at the moment, if we want to prevent mass starvation in Afghanistan, is to g allow, um, bring in food and bring in um, the necessary, uh, uh, what is needed for the population, medicine, food, water, etc., cetera, um, and negotiate a, a system of distribution Perhaps jointly by the with the UN and the Taliban, perhaps just the um, uh, UN, uh, whatever. But it needs it needs a negotiation which uh, has to be carried out properly without this threat of not recognition factor hanging over them like a sword, because recognition should be separated from you know the humanitarian crisis right now. You should have two different strands of a political activity with the Taliban. One, the question of humanitarian, and that should be done quickly. I'm amazed that two months down the road, I mean, with the car, uh, Kabul being occupied for the last two months, uh, we, we, st we have a paltry lot of uh, wheat going in from Pakistan and from Iran, but almost nothing coming in um, you know, from, from the West. And yes, there are going to be huge problems, like Richard pointed out, You know, how are you gonna run your medical um, how are you going to run the more technical aspects of your um, humanitarian relief? But I think if there's leadership, you need to tackle that. Now, even more than the present situation, I think there are three or four issues that it's, it's going to be extremely difficult for the West to get over. And it even enhances further what I say about wanting leadership. Um, the first is that uh, the, the Taliban are Deobandis. 
and they have interpreted Deobandism in the most radical conservative way, which allows for absolutely very little change. So, for example, um, we I, I I have not seen really much change from the Taliban in the in the 90s, where I spent a lot of time with them, and the Taliban today. Um, there's a lot of cosmetic change, you know, which um, but I, I essentially the the power of the Doobandi interpretation of Islam for them is what is the most important. And if they fail in that, they fear most of all division, very acute divisions within their ranks. Young people saying, well, you let us to believe that, you know, Islamic Sharia would be imposed and we, we have no, um, we have no time for this liberalism, modernism, etc. Um, and uh, and and on the other hand, if they don't liberalize, obviously they continue to um, lose the support of the international community or any support that might be coming. So I think you know this this is a problem that we should be discussing, or the international community should be discussing and discussing with the Taliban um, as to how to get over these hurdles. Because if you look back at the 90s, I mean the UN was thrown out of Afghanistan by the Taliban. Um, a lot of that was to do with Osama bin Laden and the arrival of hundreds of Arabs with him, et cetera, um, who didn't like the U UN. But the UN and the NGOs faced a real crisis. Now, we don't want to reach that level. But it's, as Saad is pointing out, it's quite possible that the Haqqanis can take such a line and say, kick them all out because, you know, these are all infidels anyway. Um, so I think, you know, you, you have a complex set of problems um, if even if there's a decision tomorrow about uh, sending aid in through um, uh, the NGOs and the UN and, and getting a, a Taliban stamp of approval for at least uh, the basics of that aid, like wheat and all, um, and keeping the banks open, et cetera, uh, then that would be a, a, a big achievement. And then you would really need to negotiate point by point uh, the other demands of the international community. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, and you need to negotiate also these points that I've raised, uh, which are usually problematic, but which will lie in your path like big heavy stones that will need to be moved. Um, and you know, finally, the 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 whole um, um, the whole need right now is for leadership and uh, commitment uh, that you know the, the Afghanistan is in a state of crisis. I don't see that leadership right now, and it is there's a there's a desperate need for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, uh, Amiri, did you want to come in? Uh, yeah, just to add um, a few points. I mean, just from the Taliban perspective, I mean, the leadership is uh, not quite a big uh, founder of the, Tal the Pakistani, uh, the Pakistani state. So, I mean, what they went through in the last 20 years or, you know, despite all the help and assistance, uh, uh, especially the Southern leadership is uh, not... Um, very happy uh, with the Pakistan. Yes, it doesn't mean that they will take any sort of stand against them because right now Pakistan is doing as much as they can to help them as much. But uh, beyond this, I don't think uh, uh, the, uh, the Taliban will improve uh, the relationship because of the Dura line. There are many other issues uh, that, the, that the leadership is stuck, especially, I mean, Pakistan is quite unpopular among uh, the Taliban fighters and low-level commanders. Uh, they're very unpopular. Uh, so to, to, I mean, and Taliban leadership is basically all their decision is what is popular among the low leadership and fighters. Uh, you know, they take that into consideration and make uh, decisions on, on, on those things. Uh, but on the other hand, yes, the Taliban are also kind of stuck, uh, you know, uh, with, the inter with the world and, uh, uh, and even the regions, for example, when it comes to especially Iran, uh, you know, who apparently doesn't want them to rule all alone the way they've been, you know, uh, doing things for the last two and a half months. So uh, they have a big uh, neighbor who is uh, not very happy with it. And then we have that, uh, you know, Uzbekistan uh, and uh, Turkmenistan who basically do, wants to be like, uh, well, we don't want to do anything. Whatever you're doing, that's your thing. We just have nothing to do with you. As long as you don't cross into our land, we have, you know, if you want to rule, we support you. If you don't want to rule, we support you. We have basically have no sort of position towards you 
um, uh, but then we have uh, Tajikistan, which is a bit more, uh, you know, on, on uh, aggressive towards the, the Taliban. So Iran and Tajikistan, um, uh, you know, the two neighbors has uh, quite uh, aggressive uh, stand. Um, I mean, Iran more or less, but uh, Tajikistan quite aggressive towards uh, the Taliban makes them, you know, only rely on uh, Pakistan. Uh, so despite now being very popular, they will, you know, kind of make it work with them. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they will bow to them uh, on, on a lot of issues. Uh, so I hope that answer a little bit uh, the question. Very good. Thank you, Amiri. So there's, there's one other question I'll take and then I'll, I'll do a, 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 another round of, uh, of, our, of our panelists before we, before we finish. But there's one, one other question here in the, in the chat, uh, which is about uh, whether Western missions should reopen. Uh, there was some talk, I think, last week or two weeks ago about the European Union uh, uh, returning in some form or another to Kabul. Um, but uh, Laurel, I don't know if, if you'd like to answer that or, or, or Saad, uh, when do you think uh, and under what conditions do you think uh, Western diplomats might return to be based in, in Kabul? Well, I mean, it's certainly important whatever the policy stance that these governments are taking, that they be in communication with the Taliban, that there be um, efforts towards dialogue around the kinds of issues that we're discussing, not because I expect that dialogue to produce some, uh, some ready results by any stretch of the imagination, but you're better off at least having that dialogue and open lines of communication than nothing at all. And it would also for these governments keep their understanding of the situation fresher than if there wasn't any dialogue. One of the, there are a number of practical problems, however. I mean, there was some reporting that the European Union was um, hoping to, planning to reopen their office, um, but the reporting also said that a sticking point was that the Taliban insisted that they be 100% responsible for providing security, that they couldn't bring in their own security people. Whether or not the EU will go along with that, I don't know, but there's no way, no how, that any American government would go along with such a measure. Uh, others might be a little more flexible, but I think the, the question of security for the personnel is going to be a major sticking point for any kind of return of American presence, even apart from any kind of political considerations. Um, most prominent among the political considerations is that the Taliban wants these missions to return because it creates the appearance, even if not the reality, of official recognition. And uh, at the moment, you don't even have American officials allowed to travel into Afghanistan. Again, this is partly, at least, um, and maybe even predominantly because of the um, security restrictions on how American diplomats can move around. So I, you know, I am hard pressed to say um, it is my firm recommendation that they return uh, and reestablish offices anytime soon because there are reasons to have um, purely for safety of personnel concerns about the current environment. But that just means you're going to have to find other means of ensuring the dialogue continues, at least through being able to travel intermittently to Afghanistan. Sorry, for some reason. Um, there's also a question about uh, the ethnocentrisms of the Afghan political elite, but perhaps I could use that to, 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 to launch into a slightly different question, which is, related to the sort of Taliban government itself and, and why the Taliban has been so reluctant to appoint non-Pashtuns uh, in, in any sort of large numbers or in any meaningful role, or even people not within the Taliban itself to a government. I mean, is, this, is there still this great reluctance to, to share power in any way? I mean, Amiri or Saad, would you like to answer that? Well, they've prevailed, they've won. They've beaten the superpower, so they they feel fully entitled to appoint um, their, their you know their, their their key people, but you know there is this tug of war within the Taliban. I mean, some of the most prominent military commanders from the south, uh, Saad Ibrahim, Zakir Fazl, Noor, 
these people, especially initially, were not appointed to any position. It's only in the second round that they came in as deputy ministers and so forth. Um, you know, they have ambitions and they have their own constituency demanding not just uh, key appointments, but also policies that reflect the very hardcore um, uh, view of Islam. Um, and, and, and um, you know, they, they, they may be only 10 or 15% of the population, but, you know, these are individuals who've sent their kids to blow themselves up. So for the leadership in Kabul, they have to, it's a fine balance, balancing act in terms of who they appoint and, and how open they are in terms of women's education and so forth. I mean, they've told me privately, you know, we're trying our best. We're, you know, we're, we're allowing girls to go to schools in 11 provinces. They can go to private universities, men and women in Herat and Kabul that we know of. Private companies can, can appoint, can hire women. We have a lot of women working, not a lot, but, you know, enough, uh, working at our TV station, both um, in the office as well as in front of the cameras. So, I, I, you know, I, I think, and by the way, I mean, there's no, there are no guarantees that they're not going to become more restrictive. Um, even if the situation uh, doesn't deteriorate, it could be by stealth, you know, they're going to impose their will slowly but surely. But at the moment, the Taliban of right the second and the Taliban of the mid of the mid 1990s are slightly different, uh, as I've mentioned. Education, women at work, media. There was no TV in the in the mid 1990s. So I think engagement is going to be important for that reason. But I mean, this is the this is the extraordinary thing. The Americans have yet to send someone to Kabul um, to meet with the Taliban. It's not enough to meet with Mutaki in Doha. You've got to go and meet the key people. Now, the Brits have been there and the, 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 the Europeans intend going there and the UN is there and the Pakistanis, Indians and everyone else is there. And the Americans, are, to an extent, of depriving themselves and us, of the, the Afghan population, of this opportunity to engage. So maybe just for, for the last round to bring it back to, to, to where we started. I mean, it seems that you have a, again, you have a, a moment now, you have a, a, a Taliban government that hasn't given a lot of signs of compromise yet but a moment now in which to, 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 to engage it. I mean, not just for the questions of, of sort of vital humanitarian aid, but also broader questions of, as we've talked about, keeping the electricity on, paying civil servant salaries, uh, you know, trying to get the economy uh, on some sort of lifeline over the winter uh, uh, to, to, to keep people alive. D do you get a sense, Laurel, in, in the US that there is this sort of urgency in these coming months to, to stave off uh, uh, you know, what could be a really terrible, terrible winter for Afghanistan? Or are, uh, uh, are people still gonna spend a lot of time sort of looking for solutions that may be very difficult to, 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 to find? Well, look, I, mean, I do think it, to be fair um, to the United States, you have to recognize that far and away, the US is the major donor um, to humanitarian assistance for Afghanistan. So of the humanitarian assistance that has been pledged, the US is far and away the biggest donor. Uh, and I do think that there is a sense of urgency about the humanitarian situation there and a commitment to continue to provide humanitarian assistance. That doesn't mean that there is a sense of urgency to have a political engagement strategy and a, a longer term, or I mean, by which I mean something beyond the next few months, um, strategy for moving towards uh, a, relate, a new relationship with Afghanistan. And that is um, in part because of the political context here in Washington. Um, this is an administration whose priorities are domestic policy right now, and there are huge issues on the domestic policy agenda. Um, at the moment, the kinds of things that the U.S. administration would need to do along the lines of what we've been discussing here to explore political dialogue, open up the spigots of assistance, um, would entail political risk because it would Moves like that could easily be characterized by the political opposition in the United States as being soft on the Taliban. This, the American government took a lot of political risk in past years in its relationship with the Afghan government and support for the Afghan government. Everyone knew there was corruption, wide reports about corruption, but the money kept flowing. And there was political risk because it was judged um, 
necessary in service of the objectives. I don't see the in the current environment an appetite for political risk, risk in support of a Taliban government, which is how it would be construed. Uh, and that is just a, a significant obstacle. I mean, so for instance, to be very specific, the central bank reserves, most of which are held in the United States, over $9 billion, $9.5 billion in the United States. There is no way, no how in the next six months, year, or maybe 20 years, or maybe ever, so long as there's a Taliban government that is anything like the current Taliban government, that that is going to be released. Um, I just, it is, it is unforeseeable on the horizon that that will be released because it would entail literally sending pallets of cash to Afghanistan. And the headline here would be, Biden sends billions, gives billions to Taliban. And it's just not gonna happen. Um, it's politically infeasible. And that's the most pointed example, but I think it just gives you, I point to it because it, it gives a, I think it illustrates the sort of um, bounds of what is politically feasible in the United States right now. Thank you, Laurel. So, so we have literally three minutes left. Uh, Saad, Amiri, uh, Ahmed, would you like to come in for some last words? If I may first, uh, in, I think uh, engage and then figure out um, what levers you have or how you can be, be become relevant again. And this is more addressed to the Americans, but also the Europeans. Um, and, and, and come up with a policy that's coherent, that's gonna serve the Afghan nation. It's gonna be, it's gonna avoid a major catastrophe. This is a tsunami of events uh, that we can see from here. It's, a, it's an accident in slow motion. Um, and that's, that's what I'm pleading for. Can I, can I just say a few words? Please, um, Laurel, uh, this is exactly what, you know, I'm, I'm, what I'm suggesting is I don't think that the, this is not the moment for a political dialogue with the Taliban. It's, it's a, it's a, the moment is for a humanitarian relief dialogue with the Taliban, with effective international leadership, which can be negotiating the terms and conditions of how West aid will come and flow into the country, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think, you know, the, there was this group of four countries who wanted an early recognition of the Taliban, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, um, and um, um, Qatar. I think they've even backed off, because and China. Uh, they've even backed off, because in a sense, they've seen that the crisis is so severe that if, if they go in for recognition right away, or in the next few weeks, they would face enormous criticism from the from the West and from other, even from Muslim countries, et cetera. So what, what we should be talking about really is the dialogue with the Taliban on humanitarian relief, the very basic of relief. And in the background, you can have a political dialogue going on with the embassies that are open there. And certainly the US should be sending someone um, in soon, I hope. But the, the key for me is, is to have a, um, a, a dialogue and that the, on the humanitarian issues. And at the moment, you, you don't have the kind of division in the international community that you did have six weeks ago, I think. I think Pakistan, Iran, these countries would be much more amenable to work with the international community on a political dialogue. And of course, on a humanitarian dialogue um, with the Taliban. Ahmed, thank you very much. Amiri, let me give you the last word. Yeah, just uh, just to add, I think there's a, um, a, a, a lot of areas between uh, international community and Taliban to cover. I mean, and there's a lot of room for them to work together. I mean, things have already been worked out, you know, in the last two or three years with the Taliban. The engagement has been very good. And 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 uh, I mean, the, the, there is a room uh, to improve the relationship uh, with each other unless things drastically get, uh, you know, changed. Change, uh, you know, when it comes to terrorism or, or airstrikes, they carry out air 
Slack and other issues. If that happens, the situation might uh, go the wrong way. But right now, I mean, what we see on the ground from the Taliban, from the leaderships, they're willing to engage with the international, particularly the US. Uh, they want the US to come back, open their embassy. They want them to engage them on a lot of political issues. Um, I mean, the, the thing is that uh, the, the, the thing is missing who trigger first uh, you know, the, 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 the discussions and uh, constructive discussions. Um, uh, and as uh, Laura says, you know, the U.S. Uh, is in it, uh, you know, politically, there are a lot of issues. So that taken into consideration, Taliban needs to make, uh, you know, some decisions uh, because they got what they wanted it in the first round. Now is the Taliban time to make some compromises. For example, like the girls' education, I think if they will eventually allow it. We don't know why there's so much... Uh, Issues. If they make a certain, like allowing women openly stating that women can go to, which they did already, but it's more, you know, uh, coming up with uh, more uh, uh, information how they can do it uh, to uh, women can go to educations and uh, go to get education and also can go to work and other. I think that will solve and start uh, a lot of good discussion with the outer world, uh, including the United States. Amiri, thank you very much. And really, let me extend a, a really a, a huge thank you to all our panelists. Uh, Laurel, thank you. Saad, thank you very much. Ahmed, thank you very much for joining. And, and Amiri, thank you too. Uh, thanks to everyone who's, uh, who's tuned in. Uh, and we hope you'll join us for future virtual events. Bye-bye.